a question from Patty. Uh, my question has to do with the number, with the difference between the number of syringes that are distributed and the number of syringes that are collected. If through SSP we're only dispensing 283,000, but we've collected 625,000, where are the rest of those coming from? Well, um, that is. A question that I, well, in truth, I don't have all of the information on that, um, or, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to uh, answer the, any hypotheticals. Um, but as I said, or as uh, Jen Herrera pointed out, um, the syringe service program is not the only access point as far as syringe distribution. Um, and well, it, it, that's a I'll, I'll question for further research. Uh, for Sean, yes, there is there is another syringe services program in it our is. community now. Um, it's a community-based organization. It's not run by the county. Um, people can purchase syringes. People can also get them uh, as a prescription from their provider. Um, so as Rashawn mentioned, there are various venues where people can get syringes. Um, which doesn't, which may not be from our county exchange. Um, I think uh, the next hand I saw was Damon, and then we'll go to Sharon. Hey there. <clears throat> uh, one quick comment uh, for Patty's question. Um, I believe that the kiosks are, they're, they're not counted. Um, none of the needles are actually physically counted there, it's actually done by weight. So if somebody throws a soda bottle in one of those kiosks, it skews the weight. Um, so there's that factor. Also, I do have a friend who uses the kiosk uh, to dispose of his uh, diabetic syringes because he can't afford to replace Sharps containers every month. He's very low income, doesn't make enough money to keep buying Sharps containers to throw away. So he just puts them all in a bag and throws them in the kiosk. So that's a benefit for him, but it also use the numbers for the syringe services program uh, concerning uh, use by addict. So everything was a little fluid there in my experience. Anyway, my question was, um, when did we go to, when did we go to five days a week access and how has that worked out? To me, it sounds like it is a really good thing to have more access for people. Yes, um, I'll go ahead and, uh, Chime in and I'll answer and Rashawn, feel free to fill in if, if you have anything else to add. Mm -hmm. um, we expanded hours per, I believe it was Supervisor McPherson's um, direction uh, to expand hours uh, to 12 hours per week, I think it was. So from that opportunity to expand our program, we actually took a look at our schedule and found that um, the majority of our participants, we did have a few participants who really liked the early morning hours that we initially had at Emmeline Clinic or Emmeline Campus. Um, but the majority of people, we even polled our participants, they all said we want afternoon and evening. Um, so we did that at the start of the pandemic. So it was a little bit uh, slow going in terms of implementation. But once we actually implemented the new schedule, to be able to distribute it shorter time frames, but throughout the five days per week, um, it's been pretty successful and we've gotten a lot of great feedback. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I would echo that. That, that, that was, uh, so it was in June that we expanded those hours. And yes, we have had uh, great feedback from our, from our participants. Thank you. And next is Sharon. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the video of what it is like for someone when they go in. I, I'm actually really impressed with that. And um, my, uh, you know, just everything, the Narcan and the ability to clean wounds and, and everything. And um, my question is, is when someone or if someone is ready to uh, get help and go to treatment, where are they referred? Um, and how many, I don't know if you know this, but how many beds are available right now? So I, I do not have the information on uh, um, availability of beds. Um, 
we refer them to our county math services and i rely on um, our math team to be the true experts um, for, for that handoff now our staff and myself um, we do try to stay as well informed as we can about um, treatment options um, but our county map team is uh, are going to be the experts on that. So um, as I pointed out in Watsonville, the exchange is staffed um, by MAC team members. So that is a, a fantastic um, collaboration. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a direct uh, handoff. Uh, when someone uh, expresses interest. Here at the MLINE exchange, we do have MAC counselors who are personing the exchange a couple shifts uh, a month, and we will make a call to a MAC counselor at um, the MLINE clinic as well and see if they are able to come up and meet a participant. Um, but for the most part, we are giving them information and um, phone numbers and relying on them to make that call when they are ready. It's a long process, as um, you may be aware. Okay, cool. And also just um, due to COVID, um, as far yeah, as like referencing them to 12 step meetings and that, uh, I understand maybe a lot of the clients don't have access to Zoom, what have you. Um, I just want to be sure that maybe this is a more of a that thing that they have all the current meeting listings um, for Zoom and there are some in-person ones too. So I just wanna make sure that that information is available. Um, and I don't know if that's something even you might keep in, on hand there, um, you know, but there's there's help out there for them that um, they could do in the meantime before they actually go into treatment. I just wanna make sure that uh, information that meeting. Yes, we so so we do have information um, available in the exchange. We have various brochures, but as as you mentioned, um, the adjustments to COVID it, it, it's been very difficult, and so we are trying to um, uh, be sure that we um, stay current as much as possible. So uh, just a time check, we have about half an hour left. Uh, we still need to do election of officers and allow for some time for public comment. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do want to make sure we are able to um, uh, address uh, your question. So um, Sharon, I see that you still have your hand up. Do you have uh, Sharon and Sharon, you're good? <laughs> okay. And Patty, uh, you have your hand up? I have two questions actually. One of them is, are we able to know the number of people who actually follow through on a referral to treatment? And my second question is, what are the qualifications of the people who are doing MAT work for the county? You know, um, so, for those questions, I'd like to uh, suggest that we table that for, for next week, but I can say that we don't have a mechanism through the SSP program to determine if someone successfully completed a treatment program. Um, part of it is because we're an anonymous program. Um, so because we're anonymous, not confidential, we don't actually collect enough identifying information to be able to track that. So we would, um, we can't, make that direct connection. Um, but that's certainly something that we can focus on uh, at next month's presentation, as well as uh, Matt counselor uh, qualifications. Um, that is, uh, I will say our Matt counselors are mental health client specialists. Those are, that is the job classification through the county. So that classification is um, public on our county website. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move us along to um, budget overview uh, from Megan. And then afterwards, we'll move along into the agenda to election of officers and any public comment. Great. Thank you. Um, so I apologize if my screen has jumped up before I was looking at my notes. <laughs> but um, here's the basics of this program. So as, as Jen mentioned in the um, 
org chart, this particular budget is, is relatively small within public health overall budget. So our total budget for this program is $223,916 annually, and we run on a fiscal year that goes July through June. So we're about halfway through at this point. Typically, all of the funds for this come from net county costs, but due to the recent new grant uh, in this fiscal year, which again ends in June, we will rece be receiving $54,398 of unanticipated revenue, which is great. So those are those are listed there as the revenue. So we have our grant, and then most of the cost comes from our net county cost of $169,518. Um, and then our expenses, we only staff the SSP with our extra help um, listed in this budget at $102,000, and then our supplies and and other office costs like computer uh, computers and uh, connection, those kinds of things, at $121,916. The non-budgeted program um, assistance and costs are listed out to the right. So, for example, the support of public health administration, our manager over the program, Socorro Gutierrez, and coordinator Rashawn Williams are not included in the overall SSP budget as they do this work um, as a part of their their overall jobs. Additionally, the syringe litter contracts have not been a part of this budget, and we are currently working on one at around $78,000 uh, for this fiscal year. So I just wanted to share that brief budget uh, information with you at this time. Thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. And next up is election of officers. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Patty, did you have another question? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. I hope everyone can hear me. So the there are two officer positions for this commission. The first one is the chairperson and the second one is the vice chairperson. The duties of the chairperson are to preside over meetings, review and approve agendas, represent the commission and communicate with the board of supervisors, obviously with the assistance of the admin support of this particular commission. The vice chairperson shall assume these same duties in the absence of the chairperson. So the way that this will work is I will call for nominations from the floor. You are welcome to nominate yourself or others. We will then ask the permission of the nominee if they wish to be considered. And then we'll do a roll call election like we did earlier, um, asking for the vote. So at this time, I can open the floor for nominations for chair. Are there any nominations for chair? I would like to nominate Sharon DeJong for chair. We have one nomination for Sharon DeJong. Sharon DeJong, would you accept this nomination? I will. Are there any other nominations for chair? Okay, uh, hearing none, we will go ahead with a with a vote. So I will call out by name, uh, yay or nay for Sharon DeJong. Um, Commissioner Chestnut. Pardon, yay, yay. Commissioner Hart. Yay. Commissioner Sturm. I believe is still absent. Um, Commissioner DeJong. Uh, yay. Can I say yay for myself? Yay. You can. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Commissioner Gardner. And Commissioner King. Yes. Commissioner DeJong is elected. Yay. Congratulations. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> the next one. We would assume the duties if the chair is unable. Do we have any nominations for vice chair? I would like to nominate Damon Bruder. Okay. Damon, do you accept this nomination? 
damn it. I mean, um, yes. <laughs> Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Okay, hearing none, we, we will go on to the election by roll call vote. So uh, those in favor say yes or yay, and those opposed say no. Uh, Commissioner Chestnut. Yay. Commissioner Hart. Yay. Commissioner Sturm. Not here. Commissioner DeJong. Yay. Commissioner Bruder. Yay. Commissioner Gardner. And Commissioner King. Yay. Commission Commissioner Bruder is elected as vice chair. Thank you all for your participation in the election of officers. Jen? Great, thank you. So next up is um, public comment. We're going to allow for three minutes and um, being in this virtual format, I'm wondering either Megan or Emily, could you keep track of time of our three minutes per speaker? Yeah. I can do that. Thanks, Emily. So do we have, um, I guess what will be easiest is if you would like to speak, if you could use the, uh, I was going to say use the raise hand function. So hopefully um, people on the phone can use that. If you're on the phone and you don't have that function, just speak up and we'll figure it out. Yeah. Um. Okay, so again, if you, uh, people, uh, non commission appointees, if you would like to speak and provide comment for the advisory commission, uh, please use the raise hand function. I don't have it. Okay, or uh, it sounds like someone would like to speak. Uh, phone number 346 8559. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> my name's Rocky Baker. Some of you are familiar of who I am. Um, I used to work with Heather um, back in the day, 30 years ago. Needle Exchange saved my life. I'm here today because of it. I worked with Needle Exchange. I was president of the National Alliance of Methadone Recovery, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, this is uh, so much stigma, I find. And um, we need to adopt some of the things that Heather had done 30 years ago, like the home deliveries, more kiosks. Um, it's not enabling, it's saving lives. And that's why harm reduction works because prohibition didn't. And I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. So we have, um, you can use the raise hand function or um, as I was right, reminded uh, by Commissioner Chestnut, you can also type a question in the chat box. If you don't have those functions, then um, feel free to speak up. We'll give it a few more seconds as anyone would, would like to speak up or provide public comment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that concludes public comment. Um, we will move now to any new business or action items. Um, so I'm going to move ahead to one last slide. Um, this is going to be our, these are our future scheduled meetings, um, which you should hopefully have uh, for our commission members. You should have a um, um, Outlook invite for already, a calendar invite. Uh, we are posting our agendas on our county's SSP website, santacruzhealth.org slash SSP, as well as asking the CAO to post it on the commission, uh, the general com board commission website as well. So um, just letting you know, that's where we're going to be posting um, our uh, agendas for the public to see in advance of these meetings. So on Tuesday, December 8th, uh, we'll be meeting again in the evening through this similar same format. Um, 
and it's going to be more of a deeper dive into the program. Uh, Commissioner King uh, will, uh, per your, your question earlier about Matt, um, will uh, be prepared to provide a little bit more information about that program um, in the referral process. And um, we also, and that's actually a great uh, segue to what we would really love to get advice on from this commission is um, information to include in our future IV drug use study session. Uh, this is something that the board has requested, a study session on the IV drug use. Um, uh, uh, what one of the supervisors mentioned is a crisis in our community and um, it would be helpful to have this advisory group's um, feedback as to how we frame that um, presentation. Um, this is going to be a presentation, a study session that's done in collaboration with probation, with the sheriff's office, with our um, uh, behavioral health division here at HSA. So it's going to be many players are involved already, but this is definitely a, a key group who we'd like to get feedback from. Um, and the reason why we're asking for feedback so early, even though we're not presenting until February, is based on the timelines for presenting to the board. We actually have to have everything packaged, finalized, ready to go about a month prior to board date. So what we're looking at is a deadline of getting this together by um, January, which really doesn't give us much time at all. Um, so we look forward to hearing your feedback then. On Tuesday, January 28th, um, we'll again be able to review uh, the IV drug study session content and review any outstanding items or feedback from this group, as well as um, determine what ongoing meeting cadence you would like to have moving forward. We have it on a monthly basis for right now, just because there's some pretty clear deliverables and some things that would be helpful to get your feedback on. But certainly it's up to you whether you would like to continue monthly or maybe on like a quarterly basis. Um, and then I put the date of Tuesday, February 2020. Uh, the specific date is TBD, but we are planning to come back to the board in February with the IV drug study session presentation, which of course um, we'll uh, let you all know about and hopefully you can all attend and um, uh, provide some feedback. So that's what's to come. Um, going back to this meeting, um, knowing kind of where we're going, uh, what new business or action items um, would you like to either follow up on or um, do you have questions amongst yourselves that you'd like to address? Yes, Damon. Hi, me again. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to point out real quick one thing and then I have another suggestion. Um, the budget for the, uh, uh, for the SSP was basically $223,916 for a year. I just wanted to point out to our commission, and I know this is about us and us only, but that's compared to the $409,000 that was handed to the other program in the county. We should probably try to bring our numbers up some somehow. Now, the other thing is, um, I feel that it would probably be really great for all of us commissioners to uh, you know, basically make it mandatory for all of us to visit uh, the exchange in person, um, not all at once, um, not announced, just walk in and, uh, and you know, be basically be a client and see how things are so that we get a real feel for how people are treated and what people need. Uh, as, as, a, as, a, as an ex-client of the syringe services program before it was taken over by the county, um, I know how it felt then. I would like to get a feel of it now, and I think it would really benefit our whole commission to have a hands-on, in-person, um, you know, just a run-through. Uh, what does anybody else think about that? I like that idea. I'll think about that. <laughs> Commissioner Bruder? Yes? I, I guess my question would be, I, I don't have a problem with visiting the program, but 
would we obviously be disclosing who we are? I mean, obviously we wouldn't be feigning to be um, a client, right? We would be coming as a commissioner or just a private citizen or a county official or? Um, well, that would, I feel that that would be on the individual's comfort level. Um, I have no problem with anybody in the world knowing who I am, what I am, where I am, and when I am. Uh, but that's just me. Um, it might be in other people's comfort zone to um, step in and say, hey, I'm on this advisory committee and I'd just like to see, I'd, I'd like to be able to observe if I could. Uh, you know, whatever whatever a person's comfort level is, I, I really don't recommend, you know, you know, you know, trying to trying to play the part of an actual client that seems uh, disingenuous. Um, although it may give a little bit more of an authentic experience, I I wouldn't want, I really wouldn't want to be, uh, um, I don't know, disingenuous. I guess is the best word. Um, but but presumably the program is trying to maintain confidentiality for the clients. And so if we're walking in there, how does that work? Well, if I were to walk in there. Um, as, as you know, Commissioner Bruder, I would walk in there and I would wait in line just like every other client, uh, not barge in, but I would walk in and I would let Rashawn or whoever may be greeting me at the door, hey, this is me, this is what I would like to do. And could you ask permission for me to over, you know, to, to view an exchange? Could you ask the next client in if it's okay with them? And if it's okay with them, then it's okay with them. And if it's not, no hard feelings, no, no, no harm, no foul, you know, um, they can maintain their anonymity. I don't need to know who they are. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, this is Patty. I uh, would like to know more about who our clients are. Who are we serving here? Do we have a body of information, data about who are the participants? Do they live here? Where are they coming from? Who, who is our client base? Can I answer that real quick? Sure. Walk down the street and look around. Sit down in a restaurant and look around. Pick a person that person may be a client. The clients don't conform to, you know, only homeless or only people in ties or only people with blue shoes. You know what I mean? Um, the, yeah. the, the, the clients are everywhere all around you. You may know some of the clients. Um, but, but really what I'm asking for is data about who are the part about the participants that we're actually serving? I mean, I get it that we have 407 participants in the course of nine months. Are, are they? Uh, uh, what happens to them? Where do they go when it's all done? Do they come back twice or three times? Are they people that we could actually make a connection with and try to help them into treatment if that's what they want? That's, those are the kinds of questions that I have. Those, those are um, uh, Rashawn and and uh, the people at his level are the people that would have what little information that there is. And that's another reason to go visit there so that maybe you can touch bases with Rashawn and sit down behind or, you know, in an office with him somewhere and say, hey, can you help me with this stuff? That would, you know, that's the in-person questions are a lot easier, uh, at least for me than trying to do things over the computer, over Zoom, that kind of stuff. I do I do much better in person. So I'd like to add that, um, you know, we can certainly do, I like the, I, I like and can definitely, we can definitely um, provide like one-on-one -on -one, um, like program check-ins with uh, the SSP commissioners. That way we can, if you'd like to do, um, get more information about the SSP program, um, we can do, a, a, actually, initially what we were hoping to do with our initial meeting was to have a tour of SSP and actually every the commission members actually walk through and 
get to role play, you know, how it is to be like a, a participant through our program. Um, so that's something we can definitely do. Uh, we do want to make sure that we are um, being very mindful of the anonymity of our clientele. And so that's something that we would have to um, work through. But um, definitely if if the commission would like to do a walkthrough of our um, of our sites and and even role play or uh, kind of guess a uh, ask questions as you're kind of going through it, then we can certainly uh, help schedule that in the near future. And then um, to Commissioner King's question about who are we serving, that is a, an excellent question and something that we also have a questions about. We want to know who we're serving as well. Um, as you saw on the slides, we don't have a whole lot of information that we collect. Um, and part of that is by design because we don't want to be too data burdensome, which then becomes too much of a barrier for people to actually continue coming back to syringe services. Um, but we did have the opportunity to do a deeper dive last fall in 2019 through our syringe litter evaluation study. Um, we got to do, a, do more um, qualitative, which uh, more like focus groups and interviews and talking to people and have that documented. Um, so we can certainly do an, a review of our um, of our findings um, of who our participants are at that uh, at the December meeting. I think um, something that uh, Commissioner Bruder, your your comment on how SSP participants can be anyone um, rings especially true for our program. Um, something when we did our syringe uh, litter evaluation, we actually utilized our syringe services program as um, a place to uh, to pull people who were housed because as we were doing outreach, obviously the people that we were talking to out on the streets uh, were people who were unhoused or homeless. And um, we do have a population who uh, of participants who are accessing our services that are housed, uh, that do have stable jobs, but you know they um, they just want to have discrete access to clean syringes and clean supplies. So we do have a wide variety of participants, and um, I'd be happy uh, us at in public health. We'd be happy to put together some presentation to again just scratch the surface on who our clients are, our participants are. So for um, some next steps of um, meeting agenda topics, uh, we have MAT referral and counseling, um, just a review of that and how it connects with our program, um, an overview of who, and an overview of who we're serving. Is um, anything else to that? And I think I'd like to know more about what the SSP um, goals are. I, I don't mean to be simple about that. I'm, I'm wondering if the people who implement the SSP program are happy with what it is that's going on now, and what do you see as um, ways to improve the program? What, what would you guys, the people the boots on the ground, if you will, wh what would you see as the way to improve this system? We can definitely talk about quality improvement at, um, at the next meeting. And uh, I'm sure, uh, hopefully we won't have to put that full burden on Rashawn. We can pull in a few of our uh, other staff members. Uh, we are heavily reliant on volunteers um, through to sustain uh, our SSP services, um, but we have a lot of very passionate folks um, who have a lot of great feedback on how to improve services in our program. Commissioner Bruder, you have a question? Hi, um, just a, another topic for, for the possibility of the next meeting. I don't know how, how heavy the burden gets on the agenda or that kind of thing. This is 
pretty darn new to me. Um, but one of the things would would be that I would that I'd like to know more about is uh, um, the frequency of HIV testing that is that is not only offered but followed through on. Um, you know how how many people are being tested, say per month or or per visit. Uh, you know that kind of thing. Um, that might help us understand what some of the goals are and whether or not we're meeting those goals, you know, the, 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 the testing processes that are offered. That's an excellent question. And I am going to partially answer that for right now, um, is that during the pandemic, in order to minimize the amount of time um, our staff were interacting with clients, we have taken a step back from HIV rapid testing and instead are referring people back to their primary care provider, their medical home, or to HPHP or another, or MLN clinic if uh, they don't have a medical home for HIV testing. Um, so that is something that we would like to restart. Um, we're trying to figure out how to do that in a way that's safe and also in a way where we have available resources to do so. Um, many of our HIV counseling staff have been deployed to support our COVID-19 pandemic response efforts. Um, so we are and it, it is something that uh, you have to go through a training and certification to actually implement. Um, I will. I would like to add, though, some um, exciting news is that we are one of the few counties that received additional funding for hepatitis C treatment, screening, and linkage, or testing, screening, uh, screening, testing, linkage, um, and there's. A, very, a lot of great research that shows successful outcomes when you have syringe services, MAT, and Hep C treatment services integrated. Um, so we're, we have two of those together, and so we're looking at how to bolster Hep C, hepatitis C uh, treatment and prevention efforts through our SSP. So it's a um, partial answer to kind of where we're at. So to put it bluntly, we wouldn't be able to get the, the specific data that you're asking for, Commissioner Bruder, but we can certainly talk to what we've done in the past and what our um, testing looked like previous to COVID and where we hope to go. Thank you. Uh, just, just for clarification, at the moment, because of COVID thing that's going on, when a person uh, comes in, you're not able to test her HIV on the spot. Um, but you refer them to other agencies. Uh, and at that point, we sort of lose whether or not they actually went to go get the test or, you know, didn't bother kind of thing. Um, that that seems to be the one downfall with that. And I understand the reasons behind it, uh, but that's from what I gathered, that is that where we're at? We sort of, you know, we refer them to and hope they go other places, but we just don't know if they're following through. Correct. And one of the videos um, you saw Rashawn actually followed up just verbally. Um, so it's an informal touch point uh, with people, but we don't actually have it as um, like a ref uh, formalized referral system because of our anonymous program. Right. Yeah. It makes it really, really, really tough. Understood. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Commissioner Dijon. Hey. Um, I was just curious if in at our next meeting we're going to have like the uh, MAT review. If we have specific questions for the MAT program, would we send those to you for them to answer? Do we wait till they present and then ask questions? What would you prefer? MAT patients are covered under CFR 42.2. That's federally protected. Okay, that, that's not what I meant. Um, I just have questions as to what the MAP program covers. And I just was wondering if we have specific questions for the people that work in the MAP program, if they're gonna be presenting, if I have questions for them, do I wait until the next meeting or can I send the questions to you to present to the people at MAP to answer next month? I think it's helpful to have questions ahead of time um, okay. to help guide the presentation. Um, right. And um, I think the email where uh, you receive the um, 
the Outlook invite, which was HSA Public Health Admin. Um, you could just reply to that with um, uh, uh, recommendations or questions for um, next next month's presentation, and we'll at the very least reply with a um, receipt, you know, read receipt message. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bruder. Sorry, forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, and uh, Commissioner Chestnut, I do see your um, your comment about looking at the rate of MET expansion, so we'll uh, include that as well, or look into that as well to include in next month's presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, I think it worked out <laughs> in this virtual format. Um, but please let us know if you have any questions, any any feedback uh, for us, and how we can best support you as the SSP Advisory Commission. And um, and with that, I guess uh, meeting adjourned. We'll see you in December. Thank you. Can I say one more thing that I really, really appreciate all you're doing in regards to the COVID and I know how incredibly difficult and um, how much work you guys are putting into it and to add this to it. Um, I just appreciate you very much. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you and this, I, I appreciate the very respectful and very thought provoking questions that came out of this uh, meeting. So. It's kind of nice to focus on something that's not COVID related. <laughs> All right, everyone, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I Thank think you. Technically, we, technically we need to make a motion to adjourn, I think. Oh, do we? I, According I, to Robert's I, rules, yes. Yeah. Okay, some guy, some guy named Robert told me to make a motion to adjourn. So there's my motion made. <laughs> Second. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 <laughs> yeah, Thank you, everybody. To adjourn is accepted. <laughs> 7 3 p.m. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great night.